Hello, I'm Pete Leiden, and I am coming in here from California, from the San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley, the region I've been part of for the last 25 years here. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, I'm not going to be able to join you there in uh, Denmark. I'd love to have done that. Uh, maybe next year when we get past this pandemic. I'm really honored, though, despite the distance, to actually be able to give this keynote to the uh, Danish Academy of Technical Sciences. My understanding is you've got about 500 folks now gathering virtually over there. Technologists, business folks, government officials, you've been working all day on this, and I'm going to wrap up with a few thoughts from the big picture, long term, looking ahead into the future. Now, it's safe to say that the zeitgeist, you could say, in America, in Europe, through the West, through the world, really in the last half a dozen to a, de a decade past, has been one of really despair. Uh, there's a, a real sense of frustration and, and anxiety among so many people that will never really be able to solve the big challenges we're faced with, uh, particularly climate change. They have no idea how we're ever going to solve climate change. Uh, they have no idea how we're going to deal with income inequality, wealth inequality in our domestic societies, but also around the world. They don't see how can we get beyond the political polarization that has really kind of debilitated uh, Western liberal democracies. And they have no idea how are we finally going to get around uh, the racial inequities and the racial tensions that are breaking out still here in America and as well as in Europe. They also have no kind of idea uh, what the future holds. They're, they're feeling uh, almost like a dystopian. There's this feeling of the future is a dystopian kind of nightmare. Uh, it's very hard for them to see uh, positive ways ahead. I actually have a very different way of thinking about what's happening in the next few years. I could see a future emerging here in the next 10, 20, 30 years and beyond, which could be a much better world. We just need a new kind of narrative and a kind of a reframe to get people to think quite differently about what lies ahead. I think we're actually going to be living through an amazing several decades. I think the next 30 years from 2020 to 2050 are just going to be an extraordinary time. First of all, we're going to see not one, but three world historical tech booms. Think of them as we're going to see the second phase of the digital revolution, the kind of AI expansion of information technologies. I think we're also going to see uh, a world historical shifts in biotech with genetic engineering and, and the like. And we're going to have a go also through a, a huge transition in our energy technologies from carbon to clean. These three booms combined are going to drive a lot of economic growth, a lot of business opportunities. Uh, but together, they're going to really, I think, outweigh and outscale essentially what we saw in the last 40 years coming off the digital revolution. And I think it'll even be more than what we saw in the post-war boom of the 20th century. What's more is I think we're going to make huge progress on many of these challenges we talked about, and we're going to make start to turn the corner even on climate change. Now, if you take one more step back, I actually think we're going to be seen with the long lens of history as a really extraordinary moment of world history. I think the period from 1980, the introduction of personal computers in the first phase of globalization, all the way through this century, including the critical next 30 years here of this transition, I think will be seen as much more widespread societal changes, a societal transformation coming off the technology booms, coming off the economic boom, and really changing the fabric of our society. So much so that I think with time, people in the next century will look back and think we really were going through more like civilizational change, something comparable to what we saw in the Enlightenment. And I'm going to make a strong case in this talk here, not only of what's coming up in the next 30 years, but how we actually are going through something comparable to what you saw 250 years ago or more with the Enlightenment. Now, first of all, you say, why, why should we listen to this guy? Well, it turns out uh, I actually went through a similar exercise and a similar kind of look ahead into the future back in the mid-90s. I was one of the early folks that came to the early Wired magazine, worked with the founders there in the mid-90s when we really were just starting to understand the implications of the Internet and the digital revolution and also the first stage of a globalization. While I was there, I essentially wrote a cover story here called The Long Boom uh, with my colleague Peter Schwartz, which was kind of a world-renowned scenario planner. Uh, and together we essentially told the story of the world. We called it The Long Boom, The History of the Future from 1980 to 2020. And this was written in the mid-90s. So in fact, we were looking ahead to the next 25 years of what was to come. And you wonder, well, how did we do? Well, honestly, we did pretty damn good. 
At the time, it was a very controversial piece. It went into a book that went into multiple languages, and for a long time was driving a conversation out of the valley here on what was possible. And uh, one of the things we said was, well, this Moore's Law, the doubling of computer power, was going to continue from that mid-90s through to 2020, and we were going to go from these clunky desktop computers of the time to these you know, super smart smartphones. And in fact, that's what happened. I mean, here we are... This is, a, by the way, in a logarithmic scale, meaning every time you go up, you go up by a factor of 10. So if this was truly going up, it'd be up through the ceiling of my little studio here. But anyhow, that just kept doubling through the entire time from 1980 through 2020, actually you start in the 70s, inexorably doubling along, making more and more powerful computers. In 1995, about 25 million people were on the internet. Now, today, it's about three billion. You can see, again, the hockey stick of just, just inexorably going up. 60% of the world now is online. Those same little goofy startups like Amazon, they grew to the commanding heights of the global economy. Apple itself, the day our, or the month, I should say, the cover story at Wired came out, uh, Apple begged Steve Jobs to come back as their CEO because they were about three months from going broke and yet now they're more than a $2 trillion company, one of the most valuable companies in the world. The entire global economy essentially was growing, all the different regions of the world different times. And in fact, except for the little dip here recently with the pandemic, it's just been inexorably going on. So what about our period then? You think, okay, that was the past. Not bad to kind of read life. But the point here is that we're going into a very similar situation now. Again, driven by some fundamental technology changes driving economic growth. In this case, we're going to start with the technologies, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that plays out here. Now, what happened in the last round of figuring this out, the long boom, was essentially a thing called the inexorables. I think of it as tracking the inexorables, either technologies that are inexorably kind of developing or huge trends that really can't be stopped. You can maybe channel these things a little bit. You can steer them a bit. But in general, under any scenario, these things are going to happen. And so I did it back then, as we just talked about some of them. And here, it, in the next 30 years, I've come up with, you know, close to a dozen of them that I just want to talk about a few of them for you here today. Now, just to give you a little better sense of what, how that works, let's just take, for example, universal connectivity. In the next 10 years, we're going to essentially have a situation where low-level satellites and all kinds of other different things that are in motion right now are going to actually bring connectivity to every single human on the planet, with a few exceptions. In other words, we're going to take on another three billion people under the internet, and it'll be the first time that we'll ever have all eight billion people on the planet connected with pretty much high bandwidth connections and very powerful smartphones. Now you think, wow, that's something extraordinary. Now, right now we think, okay, in the developed world and even the developing world, we think there's quite a few people on the internet. This, for example, shows how many folks are on the internet. But here's the thing. These are the folks that are not on the internet. We've got half of Asia still to come online. We've got about Two-thirds of Africa and the Middle East still has to come online. But in general, we've got a huge amount of people still coming. So this digital revolution has a lot more energy to go. We're entering the era of AI. And so on the backs of that, we're essentially going to get access to AI. So you're going to see over the next several decades what I would call ubiquitous AI. It'll kind of energize or inform or supercharge or empower almost all our tools. Now, one of them that's going to be a huge one is simultaneous language translation. Certainly within this decade, we're going to actually be able to get to the point where computers will be able to, in real time, with very much nuance, actually be able to communicate across all the languages in the world. We're starting to see the beginnings of it now through text-based things and some translation. But by the end of this decade, that'll be fluid and natural. Now that starts to be really interesting because when we bring all these new people on, they're not speaking the lingua franca, the business language of English. But that doesn't mean they're going to be cut, cut out of this global marketplace, this global kind of commons. In fact, they'll be able to understand and have access to all the things that we do too. Shifting quickly to biotech, we are now moving into an era of genetic understanding. Just 20 years ago, we hadn't even cracked the first human genome. And yet today, our understanding of genetics really was one of the key pieces in dealing with this pandemic in a quick way that we did. Our understanding of being able to track the genome of the mutating virus on a daily basis is something that was extremely important. And also this whole breakthrough of 
mRNA technologies, which has been developed over the last 20 years, was a huge part of developing this next generation of vaccines. Now, the biotech world is going through something very similar to the technology world and digital technologies. Again, here's another kind of logarithmic chart. You take what it took, $2 billion to sequence one human genome in the beginning of the decade here, 2000. Now it's down to about less than a thousand bucks and it's on its way to about a hundred bucks to date the average person's genome actually cracked the entire thing. Now this drop in price, again, exponential drop in price is beating essentially what Moore's law, that doubling that I'd shown you before, uh, it's essentially faster than that. And we're watching actually, the, the, because of that, the cost savings are essentially pushing into all kinds of different industries. Now, we've also, in just the last, less than the last 10 years, cracked the CRISPR kind of breakthrough that actually helps us understand how to really precisely engineer genes. We are now into the new world of genetic engineering, which opens up the whole thing of synthetic biology. In other words, our understanding of genome, of course, applies to human health, but this applies to essentially humans are now going to be able to engineer the genomes of all living things. And so that means all plants, all animals. Ultimately, that affects many materials, even right down to our food, including meat. There's many ways that this is going to filter through. And one of the big boons about this is, in fact, we'll be able to with luck, be able to build out much more sustainable materials, sustainable base forward. I think of it as we're really essentially going to build sustainable everything in the decades ahead. Now, this brings up then, of course, the third big category is energy technologies, which is, you know, people have been thinking a lot about. This too is hitting the same kind of dynamic, the same pattern that we've seen in digital technologies. So for example, let's take solar energy, which is essentially the classic example right now. The equivalent of essentially Moore's law was essentially the Swanson effect, which is if you go back to the beginning of that last era, 1980, it was about $76 a watt coming through on the uh, solar uh, cells of that time. It's now down to about 22 cents at the end of that 40 year period. And that's about a 350 times price decrease. Now, when the price comes down that fast, you then get the scaling up of essentially people buying it. This is like getting in the hands of everybody now. Now it's got a long way to go to displace carbon, but remember the nineties and remember that hockey stick growth that came off the breakthroughs of, in price. Same thing now, we are now clicked into the exponential growth of solar. Again, a log scale doubling up and up. And in fact, what we see is essentially the doubling of solar over the last 20 years. The doubling and doubling, the exponential growth on that logarithmic scale in the next 20 years. Now, if we had time, I could do the same thing in electric mobility. The cost of batteries coming down, the growth in electric vehicles going up. We're watching this happening again and again. We don't have the time to go over that kind of proof of the details, but get, take it from me. We're watching this all across the, the board. All three of these technologies are exploding in growth and accessibility, and they're starting to really scale. Now, anytime you introduce fundamentally new technologies into an economy, essentially it drives long-term growth. I mean, what in historical terms you think of as long booms are essentially usually driven by new technologies, creating new industries, which bring out all these new economic opportunities, which grow all these kind of growth opportunities. And in fact, that is essentially what drives over time the economic growth. And we've got a triple whammy driver going through this period. Now we can't just expect technological changes or economic growth to solve our problems. We tried that the last 40 years with a more hands-off approach. The market doesn't solve these things. Clearly in this next era, we're going to have to see some much more concerted, focused political will and some fundamental drivers coming through government. Our collective action as a society to solve these challenges is going to take a different kind of politics. And what it turns out, this period, I think we're heading into big changes there as well. Now, when I mentioned those inexorables that are applicable to America and the West uh, earlier, I left out two that were more not technological, but are still inexorable. One is generational change, and one is what I call new majorities, which is our societies are getting much more diverse, and they are creating much different political coalitions, driving a very different set of ideas of what we want to happen. Let me say a bit more about each of those. Now, I'm going to use this data here from uh, the United States, where I'm rooted here, uh, but it also is playing out clearly uh, in the West. 
and uh, through Europe. You have your own version of this. But here's the way to think about this. Right now, in 2020, this is the population of the United States from youngest to oldest, everybody there, and this is how many is high fi up. And if you really take this, which is essentially the workforce, you realize that the millennials, that purple group here, these are the folks at about, you know, age 39 to about 24, uh, they're the big generation now. They're the dominant generation. They're the generation that used to be the comparable counterbalance to what the boomers were. That is essentially now. If you push this out and throw that same kind of lens on the kind of workforce, you've got the entire Generation Z by that time. These are the kids born about 1997 to 2012. They are essentially very similar to the millennials in terms of their attitudes, which gets to that in a minute here. Uh, they have a very aligned politics, and they will all be essentially voting adults, 18 or older, just in 10 years. And as we see here, all the baby boomers will be of retirement age, assuming that happens about 65, or will actually be uh, seriously dying off on some level. This is just 10 years from now, folks. This is what's going to be driving our societies. Now, the one thing to know about both the millennials and Generation Z is they have a very different worldview and a very different set of attitudes than the boomers did. And because of that, the politics is going to change along those lines. One more point about politics. Politics over the course of history does have patterns. It does uh, shift over time in ways that are recognizable and can be seen over the course of history. This is definitely true in America and has its same echo in European Western democracies. So for example, if you go back to the post-war world, coming off the war, 1940 to 1980, uh, you saw very similar politics, what I, we would call a progressive politics. This is a government using it as a force for good, driving big infrastructure investments, spreading the wealth more equitably to society, essentially uh, associated in your case with the welfare state, also in our, our case with the American version was essentially the, the New Deal Society and the Great Society of that time. On the other hand, with time, those same kind of uh, systems, they kind of lose their, their, their dynatism. They kind, of, you know, they kind of fall into disrepair. They come by rote. They need some re revitalization. And so uh, the political eras often then swing to what you'd call a conservative era. This is more pro-business. They think of less of a role for government. They talk more about um, freedom is more of a how people can actually do more things, have pulled back government regulations. This has been consistently over time. In this case, we know from 1980, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, all the way to Merkel and others in Europe, there's been a kind of conservative era for the last 40 years. Well, I would strongly say that what we're seeing now is the beginning to swing back to another uh, progressive era. Uh, and what we're really seeing here in the beginnings of it is just starting, but you're seeing it even with President Joe Biden actually coming around with, with making transformational moves and shifting the role of government right in front of our very eyes here. The one year, the first year out of 2020, by the way. Uh, I think this is just a taste of things to come. And I think others behind him, particularly younger people, are going to drive that. And along the lines I said here, it's also going to be happening throughout Europe. And I think in many respects throughout the West. Your European version with Denmark here, Northern Europe in particular. You folks have got your own version of all these things. You're very technologically advanced. You would jump on these technologies early. You're very economically dynamic. You're actually going to be on these trends early as well. You've got reach all around the world. You folks are playing your own version of this. This brings up the final piece I want to talk about, which I alluded to in the beginning, how it's not just the next 30 years that are going to be an extraordinary moment in time here. But I think really, if you think about the entire period from 1980, the introduction of computers, personal computers, all the way through to 2100, 120 years, and it's going to be much closer in the amount of change to what happened in the Enlightenment, which I would call civilizational change. So if you take the Enlightenment, roughly say 1680 to 1800, you can debate a little bit about the edges there. But that period, I think, has uncanny parallels to what we're going through today. I think, in fact, it's right down to about the same 120 years, 1980 to 2020. Our transformation, what I call the transformation, is going to be very much what happened in the Enlightenment. And I'll say a few things about that to make you think. The Enlightenment came up with, I would say, six mega innovations. Huge innovations that were like system changes that frankly created the operating system that we're still living on today, centuries later. The first one of those was essentially mechanical engines, the steam engine at that time. This was a transformational technology. This was essentially allowed humans to kind of take their physical power and explode it in ways that had never happened before in the entire history of humans. 
The second one that came up was carbon energies. We started digging coal out of the ground that same period of time, and we started to scale it towards more and more refined versions of carbon energy. But in, in effect, this was a transformational fuel, the energy that could fuel these engines. The third thing is we came up with the Industrial Revolution as essentially a way to take those tools, take that fuel, and put it together so we could scale it. And it was an extraordinarily successful thing that spread wealth and prosperity all around the world. The other meta innovation was financial capitalism. I mean, before this time, we didn't really have fluid ways to actually finance things and get a return that would allow you to kind of reinvest the thing. This was essentially an invention of the Enlightenment. And it happened, in fact, and has driven so much of the change that we've seen since that time. And then, of course, there is representative democracy. That was the, one of the few American contributions at that time as a colony. But in fact, it was a huge breakthrough. Also, the French Revolution contributed hugely to that as well. But that was a breakthrough and a fundamental shift in how we organized ourselves. And finally, nation states. We have finally essentially bureaucratic nation states that had to find efficient boundaries, things that actually could organize the planet and our international relations. Now, this is the operating system all six of these have not have evolved a little bit but haven't been fundamentally challenged until now now i would argue that essentially all six of those things are in the process of getting superseded now by m comparable mega inventions or mega innovations of the transformation the first one by far is digital computers that's our mechanical engine it is the fundamental tool the fundamental building block that is driving change all over this planet and will be for many, many decades, hundreds of years to come potentially by the changes that will come through that thing. And we are now going from the carbon energies, as many as, the, as you know, good as the carbon energies were to actually scale up that production, it actually ended up in climate change. And so we are now having to figure out a way to go completely off carbon and into a clean energy, hopefully off the sustainable renewable power of the sun. Again, that is a shift in energy for the ages. Industrial revolution, they've had their industrial revolution. We have our biological revolution. Their industrial revolution, a lot of good, a lot of bad. Pollution, plastic in the oceans, all the things we know. Biological revolution is how do we build sustainable, biodegradable things that are, can live in balance and in harmony with nature. We are on the verge of doing that, and through this century, we'll perfect it. Financial capitalism has hit a point where it has created extreme wealth inequality and it is not incorporated externalities like what do you do with carbon and uh, pollution off these things. This, I think, will evolve as we're talking about stakeholder capitalism, other kind of things. We're talking about fundamental changes to capitalism itself. I just think of it as sustainable capitalism is the one I would think about. Ultimately, I think we're going to evolve from representative democracy this century. It'll probably be the second half of the century. I don't think it's going to be right around the corner. But it's just kind of crazy that we're governed by systems that were essentially, in the American case, devised in 1787. We didn't even know what electricity was, let alone electronics. It seems to me preposterous that we won't organize a better way of representing ourselves or coming up with democratic solutions through using these digital technologies. I don't know how that will happen, but I would predict in the long term that is ultimately going to happen. So get ready for that. And certainly the early stages of thinking about that. And ultimately, I think nation states will, you know, maybe remain the way the kind of royal families still remain. But ultimately, we're going to come up with a, another generation, essentially, of global governance. Uh, it, we have to figure out ways to organize a planet of 10 billion people, ultimately, uh, in a way that actually goes well beyond the kind of haphazard way we do now. I think that's also going to happen increasingly in the next 30 years, but ultimately across the whole century. We are living through an extraordinary moment in world history. You have to think in terms of, well, what can Europe do? What can Northern Europe do? What can Denmark do? What can the Danish government do? What can businesses there do? What do the various industries do? What do different companies do? What do you do? All of you watching this, we're living through an extraordinary moment. It's going to be a make or break 30 years to turn the corner on global warming, to get a handle on climate change, as well as all these other world historical challenges. We're in the game now. And I actually think that in 50, 100, 500 years from now, maybe more, people will look back on just these 30 years, 2020 to 2050, and certainly on the century of the 21st century. And they'll say, hmm, wow. What an extraordinary time. They'll say that was a period when um, the world went digital, a world historical shift. The world went digital. 
That was a time when the world went global. First time ever integrating the planet on a planetary scale. That was in the world went sustainable. And ultimately they'll look back and they'll say, that was the time of the transformation. What an extraordinary time to be alive. And so with that, I want to say, make the most of what you got going, make the most of your 30 years, finish up a great conference. And hopefully next year, I'll be able to see you over in Denmark uh, for a real face-to-face -face time. Thank you. Thank you.